Through this lecture series, we're excited to hear from experts likewise invested in promoting literacy and expanding educational access and to share this experience and knowledge with the wider New Haven community. Thank you for joining us for today's lecture. We have just a few housekeeping items. Uh, throughout the lecture, to help ensure a quality experience for all, we ask that you please keep yourself on mute. To see the speaker only, uh, please adjust to speaker view in the upper right hand corner of your screen on your Zoom. And following the lecture, you will have an opportunity to ask questions to our speaker, Dave Braze. And we ask that you please do so by typing a private message to the host using the chat function on your Zoom. And I will then read your question uh, to Dave Braze for a response. Okay, and we're thr thrilled to have Dave Braze joining us today. Natalia is going to introduce Dr. Dave Brazy. I'm sorry, Dr. Dave Brazy, not Braze. <laughs> So Dr. Dave, uh, Dave Brazy has more than 25 years experience as a research and consultant in the areas of language literacy and cognition in their application to education. Most of his research er, was spent at Haskins Laboratories where he has leadership and technical support roles in several reading research projects funded by the National Institute of Health. As part of that work, he was instrumental in developing eye tracking techniques for observing how readers interact with print in the moment. He currently works as an independent consultant for clients in government, industry, and nonprofit sectors. He maintains active affiliations with Hawkins Laboratories, where he has full-time research for 17 years. The University of Connecticut, where he's completed his PhD in linguistics in 2002, and the literacy coalition of Greater New Haven, where he has been a board member since 2015. Thank you, Natalia, for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you, Julie. Um, so uh, I guess I'm just going to dive right in. I'm still in the process of getting used to this sort of online format for things. Um, I, I very much draw a lot of energy from talking to a, talking to a room full of people. Uh, so I'm just going to imagine that's what I'm doing uh, today. Um, and um, I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about uh, let's see, where are we at? Uh, the foundations of uh, uh, reading, uh, uh, and we're going to cover, we're going to start by talking about language, because language really is the foundation of reading. And then we're going to move on and talk about how language connects to reading. And I want to be clear that what I want to do today is really just introduce some ideas and some terminology that are uh, pretty current in, among reading researchers, but often don't go much beyond reading researchers uh, out to the general public. Uh, but it's gonna be a pretty superficial introduction. 20 or 30 minutes isn't a very long time. Um, I've prepared, uh, 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 this slideshow that I've prepared for today has got 38 slides in it, and that's pretty ambitious. Uh, I'm gonna move fast. Um, if you have questions, uh, as, as Julie and Atosha said, go ahead and just uh, type them into the chat. And if they seem pressing, uh, they'll interrupt me and I'll uh, answer them along the way. Otherwise, we're going to hold, hold other questions to the end. But if you have something that urgently needs to be addressed, feel free to bring it up along the way. Okay, uh, language in its parts. We're going to talk about words. We're going to start with words because everybody knows what words are, right? Everybody's got kind of a grasp of that. Then we're going to move on to talk about things called phonemes and morphemes. Uh, give you some kind of superficial introduction to those concepts. That's just in the, in the realm of language, right? We don't even need to talk about reading to talk about those things. Then we'll go on to talk about how the, the reading process connects to those things. So the relationship between reading and language. The alphabetic principle is at the core of that relationship, certainly for English. Then we'll talk about something called phoneme awareness. Okay, we know what, we'll know what phonemes are by then, and then we'll talk about how kind of being aware of what phonemes are is important to beginning readers especially. And then we'll talk about phonics, which is the connection between, kind of the core connection between uh, uh, language and print in a language like English. Okay, so one thing I'm going to emphasize a couple of times, a uh, point I want to make, is that language and speech come first. And by that, what I mean is that they come before reading. Uh, and th this picture is just meant to depict the fact that they come uh, 
uh, first in the evolution of our species. We could talk and understand speech for tens of thousands of years before we ever thought about writing as a species. Writing, reading and writing is sort of a, it's an invention, it's a tool, it's a construct, something that we made. But language and speech is some, are things that we are evolved to do. And that's an important difference. So we're gonna jump into this by talking about language first because language is first. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the parts of language. Let's talk a little bit about the, the mechanisms that language rides on. So this picture here, um, this picture is a fairly famous picture in, in, in language research, speech research. It's called the speech chain. Um, but what I want to emphasize here, we have, we have a speaker and a listener depicted in this picture, uh, or parts of a speaker and parts of a listener, the important parts. Um, and so in each person, we've got a brain, we've got the ability to hear, and we've got the ability to speak. So language can be divided into what, what we sometimes think of as private parts, a private aspect, and a public aspect. Now, the private aspect of language is what goes on in your brain, and we can't directly observe that, right? But if the purpose of language, if a key purpose of language is communication, we need to get that stuff that's happening in your brain into somebody else's brain. And that would be challenging, but for the fact that we have mechanisms for doing that. Our brain can engage our vocal tract, and that can put, and that generates the public aspect of language, which is the, the sound waves, the speech signal that exists out in the real world where anyone can perceive it. And that perception happens by ear. So these are all mechanisms that we're evolved for. Uh, the speech that we put out as a speaker uh, falls on the ear of a listener and the sensory mechanism that they have translates the pri a public speech back into a private signal and if everything works right that lines up closely enough with what the speaker is putting out into the world or holds in their brain that they can recover the message that the speaker is trying to convey. So private language, public language are important bits. Private language lives in the brain. We have transducers, vocal tracts and ears that translate from uh, private to public language, which are sound waves out in the, which consists of sound waves out in the world. Okay, so a lot of language, really all of it lives privately in the brain. Speech is how we put that out into the world and hopefully uh, what we put out into the world is recovered by a listener and it then uh, allows them to deduce or infer or recover the message that the speaker put out there. So words are kind of a central part of language. It's a part that we're all kind of familiar with. And again, I'm talking about speech, not, not written language yet. So what is a word? Let's, let's come start with a pretty simple definition that I think works very well. A word is an association between a pronunciation and a meaning. So the meaning of a word kind of always stays in our head. But the pronunciation, we can have a record of the pronunciation in our head as part of the private aspect of that word. But we can also take that pronunciation and put it out into the world. A listener can then perceive that pronunciation, take it into their own head and say, oh, this pronunciation is associated with thus and such meaning. And therefore, uh, that's the meaning that the speaker was trying to convey to me. Okay, so I would normally ask for some examples of words here. I'm just going to pick one myself. I see my uh, uh, Croft here a little bit. Let me try this. Maybe that works a little better. So a word, coffee. Um, this isn't coffee, it's tea, but uh, we can talk about this word as 
having a pronunciation. I've, I've written it down here because that's a convenient thing to do. But again, our focus is not on the written form of the word. Uh, this word has a pronunciation, coffee, and it means something. So when I put that word on the screen, when I said it out loud, it probably evoked an image in your mind, something like this, right? So um, uh, uh, that's what language does for us, for even simple ideas all the way up to terribly complicated ideas. Now, usually very complicated ideas need more than one word to convey, and that's fine. We have mechanisms for doing that, for stringing words together into sentences, for stringing sentences into uh, longer discourses and so forth. And we're not going to talk about any of that today. We're going to talk about the very basics here, starting with words. Now, each word is an association between a pronunciation and an idea. And the notion that the words in my head, the association between a pronunciation and an idea is close enough to the words in your head, the association between a pronunciation and an idea that you carry around. That's called parity. That our languages, the language in my head is at parity with the language in your head. That's what allows communication. If parity is, is lacking, if I speak English and I'm trying to communicate with someone who doesn't, who speaks Japanese, for example, parity doesn't exist. And communication is not going to be effective in that case, at least not very, or communication by language. Okay, so words are made up on the one hand of a pronunciation, and we often hear talk about speech sounds. We can break the pronunciations of words down into smaller speech sounds. The term that you'll hear, um, some of you may have heard this term, some may not, phonemes. It comes up in connection with the pronunciations of words. A phony is the kind of minimal element of the pronunciation of a word. And they're often introduced as being speech sounds. A phoneme is a speech sound, that kind of equivalent. And that's not exactly right, because like words themselves, phonemes live in the head. They're part of the private aspect of language. They don't exist out in the real world, although they can be translated into something that does exist out in the real world. So phonemes are not quite speech sounds. They're something else. So let's look at a sequence of words that I have transcribed into their phonemic representations. Uh, some very simple words using a very small set of phonemes. Um, the system I'm using here is called the International Phonetic Alphabet, where it has a set of symbols that correspond to phonemes. Most of the symbols that I've got on this screen representing phonemes are going to be dead familiar to all of you. So I've got the K letter, the T letter, and the S letter up there in different places. And I've got this thing that looks like a combination of AE, and that's what it is. That's another symbol, and it's used to represent a particular phoneme, vowel phoneme. Uh, I don't want to dwell too long on that, but so here we've got a word that consists of three phonemes, phoneme k, the phoneme a, and the phoneme t. So if we kind of string those together into one word, we've got k, a, t, cat. Now, we can reorganize those phonemes in a different order and get a different word. So we can put the vowel first, act, at. We can reorganize them again, t, ac, tac. And this is the kind of a fundamental property of phonemes. Um, it allows us to start with a small inventory of so-called often called, what are often called speech sounds, and combine and recombine them in different orders and different combinations, and generate a, an almost endless number of pronunciations of words or potential words. So here at the bottom, we've got stack, right? Stack. So with just these four phonemes, uh, we can generate quite a few words, you can imagine more 
by additional combinations. So if we took, dropped the T, put the A in front, we would have ask, ask. Right. So recombining this small inventory of phonemes. So we're gonna come back to that. Right now I wanna talk a little bit about, kind of get into what is maybe the, the first complicated idea that I wanna introduce here. Um, phonemes are not speech sounds. Phonemes are something that lives in the head and what they are is they're kind of the idea of a group of speech sounds that go together. That's what one phoneme is. Each phoneme is a group of speech sounds that go together. And we're not very used to uh, distinguishing among the individual speech sounds that go with a particular phoneme. And it, it can be a little challenging to do, but I'm gonna try and, and bring that out for us right now. So I've got two words, uh, tack, tack and stack. And I want to focus on the T phoneme in each of these for a moment, right? And I'm going to ask you to indulge in a little exercise for me. I'll demonstrate it for you, and then I'd like you to go along and help me out. So the idea is I'm going to turn sideways to the camera here, and I'm going to put my hand where my fingers are touching the tip of my nose, but they're not touching my mouth. And I'm going to say the word tack, tack tack, tack, several times forcefully. And then I'm gonna say the word stack, 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 several times. Tack, tack, stack, stack. And I'd like you to indulge me by doing the same thing. Tack, tack, stack, stack. It will be beneficial to you if you play along. Uh, if you're not alone. So one of the things that I'm, I'm going to assume you notice when I do this in a room full of people, most people notice this. When you pronounce the T morpheme intact, there's this big puff of air that comes out. You feel it, you feel it. Tack, tack, tack. And there's that big puff of air. And when you say stack, 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 you can certainly feel some air, but there isn't that big puff that comes out with tack. And I'm just going to assume that I see a room full of people nodding in agreement, right? Mostly that's what I see. So what you're, what you're distinguishing there with the palm of your hand is the difference in sound between the T phone in tack and the T phone in stack. Those are different speech sounds. One has this kind of big puff of air that comes out with it. It's a much breathier sound, and the other doesn't. We normally don't pay attention to that at all. It's kind of, we're oblivious to it because it doesn't matter at some level. On the other hand, if we heard someone pronouncing uh, the, the, the word tack with, uh, without that puff of air, something like dak, 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 so that's tack without the puff of air. It sounds a little strange, doesn't it? It doesn't sound quite right. Um, so this is to try and convince you that phonemes are not speech sounds. They're an abstraction of speech sounds that live in our heads. Okay, I'm not gonna belabor that anymore right now. So the next question I wanna ask is, uh, how many phonemes are there in English? Now, uh, I can't hear your answers. You can uh, think about that to yourself. You may have heard someone tell you this at some point, but I wanna just reiterate it this time that when I'm asking you that, I'm not asking you about a number of speech sounds. I'm asking you about the, the number of kind of abstractions over speech sounds that live in our heads. And the answer is that depending on the kind of English you speak, the dialect, you might say, there are somewhere between 42 and 44 phonemes for that variety of English. So I want you to hold that number in your head. We're gonna come back to it later. So what that small number of phonemes does is that it lets us combine and recombine just 44, let's say, phonemes into a very large number of different word forms. How many different word pronunciations do you suppose there are? several hundred thousand in current use at any given time for modern English. 
And we get all of those pronunciations just from combining and recombining that set of 40 odd phonemes. Okay, I'm gonna pause there for just a minute. If there are any pressing questions, feel free to shoot them my way. Um, before I move on to the next topic of morphine, I'm just going to take a second. So the next term that I want to introduce then is that of a morphine. I didn't mean to do that. Uh, so an, a morphine is, so one of the things about phonemes is that they, I'm going to jump back, they don't carry any meaning in and of themselves. They're just about, they're just about knowledge of sounds and associations of sounds and the ideas, the concept of sounds, of speech sounds. They're about pronunciation only, nothing to do with meaning. A morphine, on the other hand, is a different kind of construct that is an association between a pronunciation and a meaning. Now that should sound familiar because it's exactly what I told you a word is, right? So what do we need morphemes for if we've already got words? That's the question you should be asking yourself right now. Well, a morpheme, sometimes it's a word by itself and sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's less than a word. Sometimes you need several morphemes to build up a word. So what I've got on the screen here are, well, a couple of our familiar words, cat and tack, but I've elaborated on them by adding the same morpheme, same additional morphemes. So cat and tack are morphemes like coffee, right? So coffee, cat, and tack, each is a pronunciation associated with an idea. In this case, what I've done for cat and tack is I've added an additional morpheme. If I were to say that out loud, it's cats and tacks. So each of those words, cats and tacks, consists of two morphemes. Each of those morphemes is an, asso is an association between an idea and a pronunciation. So cat, we know what that means, right? Um, and tack, we know what that means. We have an idea of it. And s is the other morpheme in each of those words. So cats, two morphemes, one word. So we've added something to the meaning of cat by adding another morpheme onto it. We've taken this singular noun and made it plural. And we've done the same thing to tack. So that's why we need morphemes because words sometimes are combinations of meaningful elements, of multiple meaningful elements. And what we've got here, uh, uh, those, those individual meaningful elements are morphemes. Now, sometimes a morpheme can stand alone as a word, cat. Cat is a single morpheme and it is a word. We call those kinds of morphemes free morphemes because they, are, they're, they have liberty, free is in liberty. They're free to stand alone. The, s, the plural S on each of these is what we would call a bound morpheme because S is never a word, can't be, can't be a word by itself. It has to be bound to another morpheme in order to stand as a part of a word. So we have free morphemes like cat and tack and bound morphemes like S. I'm going to run through a few more examples here uh, really quickly and uh, hopefully uh, not too much. I'm just going to buzz through some of these here. Oops. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay. Uh, what do I have? Six words on the screen. Let's start by looking at the top two singer and painter. Again, I've put two words on the screen. And here I'm not using the phonetic alphabet to describe the pronunciations. I've fallen back on just regular spelling to give you these words. Uh, I have added a dot between morphemes in each word. So sing plus er, paint plus er. So sing is a morpheme. It's a 
freestanding morphine. It is a word. Paint, similarly, uh, freestanding morphine. It's a word. And then we can take this er morphine and put onto sing and paint together, and we change the meaning. So singer, we take the verb sing and we put er on it and we get the, the noun singer. And it means roughly a thing or a person who does that verb, right? Who does, who is associated with the action of that verb. So singer, someone who sings. Painter, someone who paints. Okay, so now let's go down and look at the next two elements in that set. Big, er, loud, er. First thing to notice is big and loud um, are not verbs. And the er on there is doing something different than the er in singer and painter. It's not the same morphine. It looks the same, it sounds the same, but it doesn't mean the same thing. Therefore, it's a different morphine. Okay, so bigger means more big, right, roughly. Louder means more loud. So the er in this case means more of whatever the adjective that it's attached to. You notice that this er attaches to adjectives and it gives us another adjective back. Okay, so the er in singer and painter is sort of homophonous. It sounds the same as the er in louder and bigger, but it's not the same. It means something different. So then I wanna come down to the words corner and water. Those also have an er at the end, but it doesn't mean anything apart from the word of, uh, apart from, it doesn't have any meaning that is distinct from the meaning of the entire word. So you can't chop the er off of corner and know something about know something else about what corner means. So singer, you take the er off and the singing is still related. Corner, you take the er off. You've got corn, which is a word, but it's got nothing to do with corner and the er doesn't, you know, how could that possibly change corn into what corner means? It just doesn't, there's no connection there. So the er in corner and the er in water are not freestanding morphemes. I know that's probably, uh, a lot to digest, but I just want to let it let it lay it out there. Okay, so just a couple of more examples. I'm going to trot through these quickly just to give you the sense of how uh, that morphemes are everywhere. Every word consists of at least one morpheme, but very often a word will consist of quite a few more than one. So here's a set of words, each of which consists of three morphemes. So the first pair up here have one morpheme in common, un, right? So un means unlockable, something that can't be locked. Undressed means uh, we can think about starting with the verb dress and then undress, it kind of reverses the action of that verb. And then the ud on the end, that's past tense. We can get into fairly abstract meanings of morphemes as well. So the ist in words like dentistry and pianist, that means something like a person. So dentist is a person who has something to do with teeth, which is the meaning of dent. Pianist is a person who has something to do with pianos, right? And then even at the more abstract level, we can get into something like the fur in transferable and conferral. Now, I'm not laying this out because I think necessarily it's always a good idea to belabor this in the context of trying to teach a beginning reader to read. But it's helpful for you as a teacher to understand some of the complexities here because the morphological makeup of words 
has implications very often for their pronunciation, for the pronunciation of the individual morphemes. And once we get to the point of talking about reading and writing, it has implications for the spellings of words, right? So we can see that in pianist, for example, that O gets dropped off a of piano. So something happens there. Okay. All right. So I asked you how many phonemes there are in English, and we arrived at the question of some, something in the low 40s, depending on the kind of English that you're talking about. Uh, how many morphemes are there in English? Well, there are literally um, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe two or 300,000 words in current use at any given time. That doesn't mean that every individual knows that many words, far from it. But there are many, many morphemes in English as well, that go together in combinations to help us build words that mean what we need them to mean. And morphology can be kind of productive. If there's not a word that's kind of close or we don't know the word, we can kind of smoosh together some morphemes to kind of come up with a new one very often. Okay. So now we're on to our subject at hand, um, reading and the connection between reading and, uh, and, uh, and language. So I want to belabor this again. Language comes first. Language and speech come first. In the evolution of our species, we are genetically wired for language and speech. Language and speech come first in the development of the individual. Kind of typically, the typical case, the usual case is that we can speak and talk and use language very efficiently, very fluently, well before we kind of start to, to pick up reading and writing. And we pick up language really uh, without having to be taught. That's the normal case. You don't need to be taught language. You just pick it up by interacting with people, uh, others, older folks, in a normal way. Kids just do that because they're essentially evolved for the purpose. That's not the case with reading and writing. Reading and writing, there's a lot bigger spread in how easily or uh, how easily people acquire it, how easily people learn to do it. So one of my mentors once said, Reading is hard because listening is easy. And by that, he kind of meant to kind of encapsulate this idea that speech and language are easy because we're built for it. Our brains are wired for it in a way that they aren't for reading and writing. Reading and writing is something, is, it's a skill that is harder earned, that we very often need help to acquire it. So, one of the ideas that I want to try to introduce here, this is a painting. Uh, any, anybody familiar with this painting at all? It's a fairly famous painting by uh, an Impressionist artist, or he kind of came out of the Impressionist movement. By, called, his name was René Magritte. Uh, he's a Belgian fellow. It's treachery of, and this picture is called The Treachery of Images. And uh, it is a picture of, I assume you recognize, a pipe, a tobacco pipe, right? And at the bottom of it, it says in French, he's Belgian, a native French speaker, ceci n'est pas un pipe. Ceci n'est pas un pipe. So what that says is, this is not a pipe. So what do you suppose he meant by that? This is not a, he's got a picture of a pipe and he says, this is not a pipe. Well, what he meant by this, here's what he had to say. The famous pipe, this is translated from French the famous pipe, how people reproached me for it, and yet you could stuff, and yet could you stuff my pipe? No, it's just a representation, is it not? So if I had written on my picture, this is a pipe, I'd have been lying. That is a representation of a pipe. It's not a pipe. You can't use it as you would a pipe. So it's an abstraction. So that is essentially the relationship that print, reading and writing, have to language. It's a representation of language that is public for many purposes, and it's a useful representation. It's a tool that is in, 
terribly valuable, but it's not language. So Liberman also said reading is in some sense parasitic on speech. That's a little bit of a, I don't know, I think of that as a little bit gruesome, but what he meant by that is that reading depends on speech and language, but speech and language get on just fine without reading. So that again, sort of encapsulates the idea that we were, as a species, speaking and listening and using language for tens of thousands of years before we ever thought about writing, before anybody ever invented writing. And as individuals, certainly all of us at some point in our lives are perfectly fine language users. The typical four-year-old is great, right? Three and four-year-olds, you can hardly shut them up. Uh, <laughs> um, they're great language users. For the most part, readers and writers, not so much, right? They're sort of prime, they're, they're, they're on the cusp they're ready maybe by that age to start, certainly by the age of five or six to start reading. But it doesn't just happen like speaking and listening does. Um, so the alphabetic principle is the sort of at the core of the relationship between uh, print and speech, printed print and language. So if writing is a representation of language, it's got to be a representation sort of of the public aspect of language, which is speech. Letters, we might say, it is often said, in fact, that letters represent speech sounds. Now, I hope to convince you that, or at least I'm going to assert, whether I convince you or not, maybe, maybe not, that letters do not, in fact, represent speech sounds. They represent phonemes. Right? Um, So letters represent phonemes. The alphabetic principle asserts that there is a more or less predictable relationship between written letters and phonemes. For some languages, that relationship is very predictable. Spanish, for example, German's another pretty good case in point. Now for a language like English, unfortunately, the, the relationship is not quite so good. So, but it's more or less, there, there is a lot that is predictable. Um, the alphabetic principle is kind of complicated by a number of things. I asked you how many phonemes there are in English and we decided that there were more than three dozen, 43-ish. How many letters are there in the English alphabet? I'm not sure, but I don't think there are 43. So is that a problem? What is the problem? If letters represent phonemes, what's the problem? Well, we don't have enough letters to go around and therefore some of them have to do double duty somehow. And that's a complication. It's not the only complication. There are other irregularities that exist, but it is kind of the first complication that we have to address. So I'm not gonna delve into things that we have done uh, uh, in order to get our alphabet to work. Um, you can think of some of those things yourself without any trouble, I'm sure. Phonemes live privately in the brain and, our, and, and, and they are the private part of language that is most easily exposed because they include uh, what, what's necessary to translate themselves into vocal gestures that can then produce speech sounds, right? So having uh, uh, a representation that corresponds, uh, a, a mapping between letters and phonemes is efficient in the sense that we can use the same symbol for the t in tack and the t in stack even though they're different speech sounds. They're the same phoneme. They kind of behave the same way. So we don't have to have different symbols. We need a lot more symbols than even, and we already have sort of a shortage. We need a lot more symbols, a lot more double duty if we wanted to discriminate between the t in stack and the t in tack. So how does, what, what's important for a reader? in order to kind of come to grips with the alphabetic principle. If letters are an association between phonemes, 
if letters are associated with phonemes, if they represent phonemes, then first of all, the first task a reader needs is to, to have some concept of what a phoneme is. And that can be quite challenging, right? So kids don't come by that naturally. Just because we have the kind of the, the cognitive mechanisms for dealing with those things doesn't mean that it's that we have the ability to think consciously about it. Think for a minute about how easy it might be for you to think consciously about what your brain is doing in order to get you to walk across a room. You're really good at that, right? We're all pretty good at, you know, on average, a typical person uh, at, at kind of engaging in an activity like walking. But we don't have kind of the ability to really introspect on what we're doing when we're walking. And if we try, you know, we might end up falling on our face. We try to think too hard about putting one foot in front of the other. Right? And this is kind of the same kind of problem that kids at the beginning of learning to read, if it's, it's very challenging for them to know what those letters are for, if they haven't kind of the cognitive, you know, sort of learned to think and introspect a little bit about speech, speech sounds or phonemes. So there are a number of tasks that we use out there for, for kind of uh, judging, gauging the developmental state of kids with regard to their preparedness for learning to read. So you hear kind of phony, uh, about a phoneme blending task, for example, that can be used to gauge kids. So this is, you give a kid a sequence of phonemes like t, ak, and ask them, okay, string those together, blend them together and tell me what word that makes, t -ac. Now, that's fairly easy for us as mature adults, but children, young children, beginning readers often struggle with that. And that's not even a reading task, right? They'll sometimes say something, give a response like, to ack, to ack. And that's not, that's not tack. So other words that other, other sorts of tasks are used to uh, uh, try and tap into children's developmental preparedness as well. But I'm just gonna skip ahead. So before kids really can comfortably engage with learning the associations between letters and phonemes, they need to have some kind of awareness of what phonemes are and how to manipulate them and how to think about them. Then we go on to what's called in the literature phonics. So this is, again, the knowledge of, explicit knowledge of the relationship between letters and phonemes. Well, the letters are kind of easy. They're these things on the screen. They're the easier part, but the, the phonemes are a little abstract. Right? And getting that, getting kids to appreciate what a phoneme is is kind of the first real challenge to getting them to appreciate an association between a letter and a phoneme. That takes explicit instruction, both of these things, explicit instruction in the relationships, and it often takes a lot of help in getting them to appreciate what phonemes are. So English phonics is complicated by the fact that the connection between letters and phonemes is only more or less predictable for a whole bunch of reasons that we're not gonna go into here. Um, I want to introduce here, kind of, you, probably most of you, if you're engaged in reading tutoring, uh, these sort of five big ideas in reading. I want to point out, kind of at the bottom here, this comes out of a research program that was uh, a research summary that was published by the National Institutes of Health more than 20 years ago. Um, phonological awareness is kind of at the bottom. Phonological awareness sort of encompasses phonemic awareness. Phonic knowledge, we've talked about that. Vocabulary, words, words and in fact morphemes, right? Kind of belong to vocabulary. We didn't touch on reading fluency and comprehension. Those things sort of emerge out of having a good handle on the other three elements. So here's what we've done today. We talked about language and its parts. So words, phonemes, morphemes, and the the idea of public versus private language, aspects of language. We talked about the connections of reading to language, the relationship, speech and language come first. Speech, reading and writing 
are sort of parasitic on, they depend on speech and language in, in a way that the reverse is not true. The alphabetic principle is sort of the core idea, the core mapping between uh, the, printed, the printed word and the spoken word. So letters, of course, letters represent phonemes. Phoneme awareness is important to being able to appreciate that relationship and phonics is kind of the, the, the bottom line. Phonics is knowledge of the relationship between letters and uh, letters and phonemes printed speech. So I've, I've kind of bring, bring to mind a couple of books here that go into a little bit more depth on some of these ideas. I don't want to just leave you hanging. Um, I, I had thought I'd heard at some point that New Haven Reads has a, has a library. Of course, it's probably mostly inaccessible these days. But these are both pretty good books. I'm going to hold up my copies of this. This is, uh, it may not work very well. Um, ah, it's not going to work very. Here we go. So, um, uh, Speech to Print. This is the first edition of the book by Louisa Motes. This is geared toward reading teachers, early elementary teachers. Um, uh, like I say, this is the first edition. It's pretty good. It's very practical. It talks about all the ideas in a little bit greater depth, not to the extent that a researcher, an educational researcher, or a linguist would go into, but certainly uh, to the depth necessary for uh, a reading teacher, someone interested in teaching to read. It's a, a guidebook, essentially, for teaching early reading. Uh, it's very practical in nature. Uh, a, a slightly more abstract book, sort of high level, but it's still uh, written for not a researcher, written for kind of a general audience of teachers, parents, interested folks is this one by Marilyn Adams, Beginning to Read. And again, it covers uh, a lot of the same ideas. They're both good books. They've both been out for a few years. You could probably pick either one of them up used. I don't think there's a second edition of, uh, uh, of this one out, of the Adams book out. Uh, but, um, you know, if, if you're interested in exploring some of these ideas in the context of, uh, uh, of of teaching reading, then those are both great places to start. If you're interested in kind of the practical aspect, start with the Motes book. If you're interested more in kind of slightly more abstract ideas, then start with the Adams book. Both of them are worth reading uh, by themselves though. And that's all I have to say. Um, I hope I've piqued your interest a little bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Breezy. We do have a, a couple questions that have come in. Um, if you wouldn't mind taking a few minutes. Not at all. Great. Um, one is a very big problem in tutoring young readers is the fact that the correspondence between phonemes and letters in English is so variable. For example, no and now, thought and though, mo and now. It is so hard to use phonics when the rules change all the time. Any advice? Well, so you're certainly right that, and, and this is the point I was trying to drive at, that um, the relationship between phonemes and letters is only more or less predictable. But I would argue that it is more, more predictable. It is, there's a, the idea is that you would kind of like to focus as much as possible, especially for very beginning readers on the parts that are predictable. So you can do that in part by controlling the vocabulary that you introduce. So, uh, there are primers out there that are written with this in mind, so that only uh, use words that have uh, kind of well-defined relationships. Now, once you start to work with kids that are kind of beyond the very beginning stages of learning to read, so they're, they're starting to want to read independently, for example, things get a little more challenging because they're going to want to read uh, material that is more consistent, that is consistent with their more mature state. And they're going to want to engage in free reading and, um, you know, the, the, the range of material. And you're going to have to confront some of these things. What I would suggest, though, is that there are often what we would call, if not perfect correspondences, there are sub, what we might think of as sub-regularities. And what do I mean by that? So there's this OU, 
O-U-G-H, or this G-H pair of letters that occurs in many places, quite a few places in English writing, in English words, printed words. Um, it's sometimes, it's, there, there, there are a limited set of sounds that it could represent. So we have words like cough and trough, for example, where the, that O-U-G-H sounds the same, right? And so you can point out those semi-regularities and you can kind of build up in the, the learner the idea that, well, there are certain, certain things that it might, that that O-U-G-H, that G-H might represent, certain pronunciations that it might represent. And I can just kind of trot through all of them and see which one makes a word with the beginning sound because the C in cough and the TR in trough, those are, those are dead easy, right? Those are predictable. Focus on the predictable part. So I've got uh, TR and then I've got O-U-G-H. Is that tro as in though? Nah, tro, tro, that's not a word. How about off, off as in cough, trough, trough. I, th I think I've heard a word like that before. Okay, trough, does that make sense here in whatever I'm reading? Okay, so you can kind of in, engage in that, uh, in teaching them to kind of recognize that there are very often these subregularities. Now often, sometimes, there are words that don't participate in any subregularities, but a lot of irregular spellings, what are called irregular, are not purely irregular. So trough and cough consist of a subregularity. I think there are some other members as well. And you know, in a few cases, you just have to, you just have to know words like yacht and debt, right? I hope that answers the question. Thanks. We have another question. Um, can you talk about the value of reading aloud to children to help them read? Which I think you, you just touched on a bit in your previous answer. Right. So um, there are a couple of different forms of reading aloud to children. So, so it, one, of the, one of the reasons for doing it is part of modeling, kind of good modeling. And you can do this for children beginning in infancy. So I think reading aloud to children is a great way to show them, kind of help them be interested in reading. It shows them that you're interested in reading. And of course you can read to yourself in their presence, a newspaper, a book, whatever rocks your boat. And that helps them see that it's something that you like doing and you value. If you read to them, they come to uh, associate reading with engaging stories. Hopefully you're not reading them the New York Times in the crib. Uh, you're reading them something that's going to be interesting to them. And, and they'll come to associate that with a good time with mom or dad or grandma or grandpa or whoever. So that's one form of reading aloud that's tremendously helpful. It, it's a shared activity and kids, you know, through that come to appreciate it. They come to appreciate that it's something that, that adults do and that it's a valuable activity. So the other form of reading aloud is sort of parallel reading. So this is with someone who is either beginning to read themselves or is already a reader. So this is something where you can sit down and take turns reading the same text, take turns with the child reading the same text. And this models for them the activity. Now the, the modal, the typical form of reading that we want to that we often want to cultivate in kids is silent reading. But beginning readers especially struggle, can struggle with that and they kind of naturally want to read aloud because that's what, that's the visible form of reading. That's kind of the most obvious. But if you take turns reading with them, I mean, you're sitting side by side reading a book with kids or you have it on a shared screen or what have you, that helps them to see that, you know, maybe you stumble over a word every once in a while, too, and that's not a bad thing, necessarily. You shouldn't try to cover that or sweep it under the rug. It's a natural part of the activity, right? And it helps them. So you want to, you want to, it, it, it presents reading as an activity that has value. It lets you, as a relatively skilled reader, model the activity, how you do it for them, the less skilled reader. And it lets them see you that, you know, stumbling every once in a while isn't a big deal. It just happens. So they don't need to be embarrassed about that. 
So a lot of different things that you can do with reading aloud and shared reading. Hope that helps. Great, and maybe if you have time for one last one, and then perhaps I could send, there's a few that have come in since, I could send those to you an email, maybe um, for responses, if that sure. works for you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm good. I can stick around for, for a little while longer, even if people are interested. Okay, we do have a couple more. Um, one person is asking, how do the five senses fit into phonemes? Well, uh, so, so the most important sense with regard to kind of phonemes is, is hearing. This is for oral language. I'm gonna leave aside the issue of signed languages for now. That's an important topic that I'm just not going to address at all. But for spoken language, the most important sense in relation to phonemes is hearing, right? Because that sense is the sense responsible for translating a public signal, a speech sound, into a phoneme in the head or a string of phonemes in the head that's hopefully going to map onto a pronunciation. It's not the only one that matters for spoken language. So the uh, other one that really matters is sight. So sight is important because especially in noisy environments, if we can see our, the, the speaker's mouth as they're speaking, if we don't hear them quite right, the, the visual cues that we can pick up may help us to understand, to again, translate a degraded acoustic signal, because it's noisy, into the right phoneme. Whereas that may fail if we can't see their see them speak. Now we've probably often had the experience of talking to someone on the phone and so, you know, not necessarily picking up exactly what, it's, it's harder sometimes to appreciate what someone is saying on the phone when you can't see them. So there, there are visual cues that we get as well, but by far the most important sense is hearing, sight also matters. I can't imagine that taste and touch necessarily uh, and smell matter in the typical case, Helen Keller aside. Okay. Um, and thank you so much for sticking around to address these. Um, we do have another question. Uh, at some point, isn't reading fluently dependent on memorizing words so the child recognizes them rather than sounds them out? So the research on fluent reading has kind of pretty unambiguously demonstrated that words that are words that are more transparent in terms of their relationship between speech and print, phonemes and print, phonemes and letters, are easier to read, even for skilled readers. Um, so a word like yacht is always going to be a little bit of a struggle, even for a skilled reader, even though it's, you know, fairly unique, fairly memorizable and a pure, purely visual. So, so what reading researchers have taken, have inferred from this, and I think, you know, this and other evidence is that even very skilled readers use a processing path that goes from sound signal speech in the real world to something that gets translated by the ear into phonemes, a string of phonemes, a pronunciation that then gets associated with a meaning. So it's sound, kind of internal pronunciation, then meaning. We don't go straight from sound to meaning. Uh, and the same sort of thing occurs with, with reading. Uh, we, we see the visual depiction of a word and that gets translated into an internal pronunciation and then it goes to meaning. Now there may be some ways in which that kind of can get short circuited, but even for very skilled readers, that is arguably a key mechanism in appreciating the meaning of a word. We don't memorize them in that, in sort of in that way. We don't read visually, mostly, even as very skilled readers. There's this kind of mediation of pronunciation there. 
Great. We have one last question here. <laughs> um, as a seventh and eighth grade ELA teacher, how do I make the connections if I'm unable to present an audio of what they will be reading on their own? I'm trying to maximize their independent reading experiences. So um, let, me, let me come back. So can, can you just read that again? Of course. As a seventh and eighth grade ELA teacher, how do I make the connections if I'm unable to present an audio of what they will be reading on their own? I'm trying to maximize their independent reading experiences. So I'm, I'm gonna guess a little bit about the question. Um, so, you know, if, if you're responsible for a classroom in these days of COVID-19, I, I, I take that to be the context. Um, and, you know, the challenge is that you may not be there uh, when they're struggling with reading through whatever material you've assigned to them. You've given them the written text, but you don't have the resources to also give them uh, an audio book of the same text. Yeah, it's not necessarily clear that you would even want them to do that, right? So um, presumably you're giving them sort of ability appropriate materials to read, something that's a little bit challenging for them, right? You don't wanna give them something that's dead easy, but something that's gonna challenge them at some level. So most of the words in that text are gonna be words that they know. And I, I would say that as a teacher, uh, I've never been a middle school teacher, but as a teacher, you wanna, you wanna provide other resources for those kids. So one of the resources, you know, knowledge about what to do if you come across something that you, um, a word that you don't know. Well, you know, the, when most of us were in school, the first trick was look it up. Now we used a paper dictionary to do that, right? You would find that word in the dictionary and there would be some squiggles in there that were supposed to give us the pronunciation in something like that IPA transcription. Now, kids today have a big advantage over that. They can plug it into an online dictionary. Dictionary.com is, is one. That's, uh, you plug it in there and it'll spit most of the time. It'll find the word in the dictionary and it will also give you the, give you the definition and it'll give you the squiggles that correspond to the pronunciation. But typically there's a little speaker icon right there too, right? And I'm, I'm, I hope I'm not sounding condescending, but really what you wanna do is give them the tools to address this independently. You want independent reading, you wanna cultivate independent reading. And you need to teach them the tools that will help them to be independent. And the knowledge that they can and should use the dictionary when they need to is I think a core part of that. And an online dictionary is great and there are free ones and there are even better ones that you can you know, get for pay. So if dictionary.com fails you because some esoteric word that you wanna look up isn't in there, then you know, there are other mechanisms as well. So the, so the answer I think is for most of the time, look it up. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, thank you to Dr. Brazy. Uh, especially for sticking around and addressing those questions. Thank you to all of you uh, who came to this lecture and who hung out for our Q&A. Um, we will be making this lecture uh, available to you in recording. It will be on our YouTube channel as well. Um, and we hope that you can all join us uh, next Saturday, August 8th, the same time for our next lecture with Wendy North. We'll be discussing misperceptions of dyslexia. Thank you so much, Dr. Brazy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Julie. Very glad to be here. Great. Have a good afternoon, everyone.